John is the Senior Project Director of Statistical Research here in Tucson. He has 20 years experience as an archaeologist in the U.S. Southwest, with particular experience in prehistoric stone artifact technologies, landscape archaeology, archaic and ceramic period economic adaptations, and material culture, as well as the transition to agriculture in the prehistoric Southwest. Tonight, John will take us back to approximately 3000 BC in the Western Phoenix Basin. Please welcome John Hall. All right. Well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? <clears throat> well, like she said, uh, my name is John Hall, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Luke Solar Project. Um, so the Luke Solar Project is uh, what you would call a big archaeological project. Uh, we had field work that lasted over a year, and we also spent over a year analyzing the results, writing a report. Uh, this was uh, a collaboration between several different agencies and several different companies. Uh, we had dozens of people in the field and in the laboratory and as analysts, um, and it was a multi-million dollar project. So this was definitely, you know, what you would consider big. And uh, with most big projects, we also have big ideas and, and big data sets. Uh, so hopefully uh, the information that we got in this project is, is interesting, rises to the occasion of big and important. Um, so this project came about uh, as part of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Uh, and that was a federal mandate for uh, federal institutions to decrease the amount of non-renewable natural resources that they were using uh, by 20% by the year 2015, so that has expired. Um, and also the Arizona Corporation Commission uh, had a similar initiative to have Arizona utilities uh, increase the amount of renewable natural resources uh, by 15% uh, by the year 2025. So sort of the, uh, the marriage of these two uh, initiatives uh, brought on this project and Luke Air Force Base partnered with Arizona Public Service Company or APS which provides power to the Phoenix area and they plan to build a 15 megawatt solar power array on Luke Air Force Base. So to give you an idea 15 megawatts is over a hundred acres of solar panels. So this is a big, a big array. And it would generate enough power, they think, to, uh, to make up 50% of Luke Air Force's power. Uh, and, you know, Luke Air Force Base, if you don't know, it's a big base. And they have over 100 F-16 and F-35 jets that train there. So it's a, it's a major training center, a big base. So that's definitely a, a lot of power. Um, and good news, it's done. And as of June 2015, uh, all panels are up and running and are currently uh, collecting power and feeding that into the APS grid. So um, certainly, you know, as an archaeologist, it's good to see a project, you know, fulfilled like this. And it's a green project, so it's, you know, it's nice to have uh, something that you can uh, appreciate at the end of the day. So, so that's a good thing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the history of, of archaeology in the Phoenix Basin. Uh, people have been coming to the Phoenix Basin for over a hundred years, uh, doing research and excavations, and this has really all been focused on the Hohokam culture, and, and that's okay because uh, the Hohokam culture has, you know, monumental architecture, and the beautiful red on buff pottery, and the imported jewelry and the shell, the turquoise an enormous uh, prehistoric canal system all throughout the basin. Um, so it's really not a criticism that there was so much attention uh, paid to the Hohokam because you know, it's very important in the history of Arizona. Um, but during this time, like since the late 1800s, uh, archaic period sites or pre-ceramic sites, uh, the people that were here before the Hohokam, uh, those types of sites and those remains were um, uh, relatively unknown. Uh, there was very few discoveries uh, in the Phoenix Basin. Um, and to make a very important uh, corollary here, of course, uh, in Tucson you get 
all of these uh, archaic and early agricultural sediments just right down along the Santa Cruz River, really close to here. Um, so that's a very different picture, even though Luke Air Force Base is only about 130 miles from where we are right now. Um, despite that proximity, uh, there's very different uh, things going on. The, uh, the early agricultural villages that are emerging in the Tucson Basin around 2000 BC, uh, you don't really see that so much um, in the Phoenix Basin. And there could be several reasons for that. Uh, but uh, it wasn't until the last maybe 10 or 15 years that archaic sites were really starting to be recognized in the Phoenix Basin. And none of these sites really had any evidence of agriculture. Uh, these were mostly uh, resource processing sites. Um, so I'm going to give you a little context. This is the northwestern Phoenix Basin area. And you can see Luke Air Force Base is highlighted in red. Um, and there's a couple important landforms that I want to point out. Uh, first is the White Tank Mountains, and that's uh, generally considered the western boundary of the Phoenix Basin. Uh, and that's about seven miles west of the base. Uh, and also the Agua Fria River flows generally north-south uh, through that part of the basin, and that's about three miles to the east of the base. Uh, so this is what Luke Air Force Base looks like. Um, and I want to draw your attention to uh, the center area, this large square area, that's uh, relatively undeveloped. And uh, as you can see, like to the west, there's all kinds of agriculture. And to the east, there's all kinds of uh, housing developments and uh, lots of construction. But this area has been relatively undisturbed. And that's really important uh, because a lot of the prehistoric remains uh, that we uncovered uh, during the Luke Solar Project were very shallow. So we're talking only about 50 centimeters below the modern ground surface, or about 18 inches. So any agriculture, any plowing, or any construction would have uh, certainly obliterated uh, the record here. So we were fortunate to have an area that was uh, completely undisturbed uh, by modern activities. And you can see the scar right here is uh, the result of our excavations. Uh, so this is our project area uh, before the excavations. Uh, so that black line is the 107-acre <coughs> footprint of the solar panels. And you can see it's a relatively uh, mundane kind of uh, desert landscape. There's a little drainage that kind of runs along the, the east side, and there's a few little trees. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not that, uh, not that interesting, I guess. And this is what it looks like before our excavation, so it's a pretty unremarkable desert. This isn't the kind of desert that you think of, like the Upper Sonoran Desert with the saguaros and all the trees and the lush vegetation. Um, this is the Lower Colorado subdivision, uh, and this is the saltbush series. So all these little, oops, sorry about that. All these little uh, shrubs you see here are saltbush, and they're very tolerant of the saline soils um, or the sediments that are here. So you know, again, it's a pretty unremarkable uh, landscape. Uh, it's not the kind of place that you would go and really think, hey, I want to live here, <laughs> really. Um, so, you know, why is this important? Um, well, I think a lot of the, the geology has a lot to do with that. Um, and this landscape is what we would call a lower Bajada environment. So this is the very end, or the distal toe, of alluvial fans that come off of the White Tank Mountains. And those are the White Tanks in the background, by the way. So as stormwater rushes off the White Tank Mountains, uh, it picks up big loads of sediment and rock, and it uh, washes this downslope, and it gets funneled into uh, big channels. And these channels head south towards the Agua Fria River. But in this area, they never actually reach the river. Uh, they get to this point around Luke Air Force Base, and they hit this flat gradient where it's no longer, where there's no longer any uh, change in elevation. And those uh, channels tend to fan out. And as they fan out, they drop all of those fine grain sediments, like your silt and your sand. So this area has been slowly accumulating sediments over thousands of years, but very slow and very gradual. Um, so it's in this type of environment that we've, uh, 
that we've uncovered this site. And here's a geologic map or a geomorphic map of our project area. And you can see each of these colors and corresponding numbers corresponds to a different uh, depositional event or a series of events. Um, so you get uh, different, different periods of deposition that, uh, that lay down sediments at different times. And it becomes very complicated, uh, even though the vertical stratigraphy is relatively simple. And you have almost the entire Holocene uh, within about a meter or a meter and a half of the modern ground surface. So you have the last 7,000 years, a uh, very short, uh, shallow profile. But the lateral complexity is very, very complicated. And you can see all kinds of paleo channels and different depositional episodes where different pulses of deposition are uh, coming into the project area and laying down sediments. Uh, so you can see on the graph on the right hand side, uh, one of the biggest contributions to this project was building a geochronologic model. So we were able to take uh, burned plant material, charcoal, uh, from features and then from the natural sediments, and we were able to date the stratigraphy. So each of these uh, colors represents a gray area on the right hand side. So we were able to show when periods of deposition were occurring and when there were periods of stability or uh, periods when the erosion had taken away other parts of uh, the depositional record. So you can see some of these periods of deposition lasted thousands of years and others were very quick, only a couple hundred years. So we were able to date almost every single feature in the project area using this method. And I'll, uh, I'll get back to the chronology a little bit, in a little bit. Um, so not only is the uh, geomorphology of the project area uh, interesting and very important, there's also a very unique geologic feature that's immediately south of the base. Um, and that's in the form of salt domes. So these two salt domes are the result of uh, uplifting from massive salt deposits that are buried hundreds and hundreds of feet below the surface. And in fact, if you, uh, if you know the area and you're driving down Glendale Avenue towards the base, there's a Morton Salt Factory that's right there, right alongside the road. And they send down very deep cores and uh, shoot water down into these cores to dissolve some of the salt. And then they suck it back out into the ground and just basically shoot it out of a hose. So when you're driving down the road, there's these enormous pyramids of salt and these huge white domes that are just, you know, right out in the open. And there's trucks constantly pulling in there and they package it up and take it off to process it. But this just shows you like what a massive deposit this is. And so the, in our project area, or near our project area, these uh, salt domes are the result of sort of the upward movement or swelling of the salt. And it's created two little hills and uh, the upward movement of the salt or the swelling has pushed these, um, some ancient, very old uh, valley fill deposits that have been completely cemented with calcium carbonate over thousands and thousands of years, so either as old as the Pleistocene or even more. So these old deposits are being raised up in this area, and they are completely impermeable to water, so they have created a very high water table in this location. And at the same time, right along the edge of these salt domes, you get these little topographic low points. So when water is rushing off the White Tank Mountains, it's, it's being funneled into this area and concentrated. So you get these two situations going at the same time where you have a perched water table and uh, water being drawn in from a large area. And you have these, uh, probably during the summer, you have these cienegas or marshy areas. And these marshy areas would have been a great place for mesquite to grow and for other plants, and that would have attracted animals, and of course, humans. And of course, this is a 1956 aerial image, and you can see these really dark areas, and these are those mesquite bosques or mesquite forests. And we think these were prominent in attracting people to this area. Because like I said before, this is a pretty unremarkable part of the desert. You know, you 
this is not where you want to go. It's, it's relatively resource, resource poor. But with the advent of these marshy areas, these mesquite bosques, you suddenly have a very rich resource area. Uh, we were able to uh, investigate some of this in the southern part of the project area. We uh, uncovered some clay lenses and some carbonate lenses that we think are the result of this uh, high water table percolating up. And we dated those to about seven or 8,000 BP. So we know that uh, this situation was going on very early uh, in the mid Holocene. So this, you know, when uh, archaic groups were first coming into this area and their populations were rising, uh, this would have been available for them to, uh, to take advantage of. And of course we also know, or many of you know, uh, the uh, mesquite tree is a very stable and important resource in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, mesquite pods are easy to collect and they're easy to pound and grind up into flour. And that flour is very nutritious, has lots of carbs, uh, lots of protein. And if you add a little bit of water, you can make these little mesquite cakes. Um, and those mesquite cakes, once they dry, they're very good at preserving. You can bury them in the ground. And as long as rodents and insects don't get to them, they can last for a long, long time. So this would be a great staple once uh, to come to this location and process this mesquite and store it, and then you could come back at other times, uh, in stressful times when there's not enough food, uh, and these would be available for food. So it's, uh, there's a lot of things going on that I think are important here. Uh, so now that I've given you kind of the context of the geology of the area, um, I want to talk about uh, the sort of the process that we went through in this project and the steps that we took to uncover such a big <coughs> site. Um, when uh, statistical research was first hired by Luke Air Force Base, uh, the project area had already been surveyed several times and in the early 90s and early 2000s, and they had identified six previously reported sites. Uh, and these sites are all uh, surface artifact scatters, um, not, uh, not that interesting. There wasn't any surface indication of features, it was really just uh, you know, artifacts and occasional burn rocks. Um, and there actually had been a little bit of mechanical trenching in the project area uh, during 2006. And those trenches found absolutely no artifacts or features uh, below the ground. So when this project first came about, um, and I was told I was gonna be a part of it, I really thought, you know, this was gonna be easy. We've got six little sites, you know, we'll go and we'll collect some artifacts and dig some trenches. We probably won't find anything, and then we can go home. And it'll be great, and it'll be two weeks, and no problem. Well, things changed. And uh, so this is the uh, project area with the sites. Uh, those dotted lines represent the site boundaries. Uh, those yellow lines uh, through the sites represent backhoe trenches that we excavated to test for buried archaeology. Uh, and also, we did a... Oops, we also did a small amount of mechanical stripping. These little red areas are uh, mechanical stripping units. So we did about two acres of mechanical stripping in addition to the backup trenches. Um, and I have to say, you know, when we started this trenching program, uh, I think it was an hour into excavating these trenches that we started finding buried features. So, you know, there were, you know, it was a surprise, but, um, uh, one thing, another thing that we identified too here was that the location of buried features did not correlate well with uh, surface artifacts. And that's not really a surprise, but uh, so we knew that the, the site boundaries that we had um, did not necessarily indicate where buried features were going to be located. So we had to expand our testing. So these blue lines are backhoe trenches that we excavated outside of site boundaries. And sure enough, uh, buried features were showing up all over the place. And so we had quite a few, and by this point we knew this was going to be a big project and it was going to be a, a big deal. Uh, the results of our testing, we collected about 2,000 artifacts off the surface and 
All of our trenches, about 128 trenches, all together equaled about 3.3 miles of trench. So this was a very extensive trenching. Uh, and as I said, we also did a little bit of mechanical stripping. Uh, and as a result of those trenches and those mechanical stripping units, uh, we identified 350 buried features here, which is a lot for a testing phase. Um, so again, another map uh, showing the site boundaries and all of the trenches and the stripping units. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's lots of little dots here and in this area and over here. Those are all features. Those are just single dots for a feature. Uh, but importantly, all of the features that we identified, all the buried features, are located within this white circle that's right in the center of the project area. So we knew that there wasn't anything in the southwest or northeast corners, uh, so we had a, a pretty good boundary of where these features are originally. Um, but now we have a conundrum because we have four archaeological sites within this boundary. And the results of our testing show that this is really one big site. So we coordinated with the Arizona State Museum and we combined those four sites into one large site. Uh, and we called that site Falcon Landing. And the Falcon Landing name came about um, sort of as a tribute to the F-16 Fighting Falcons that train at Luke Air Force Base. Uh, and as you can see here, the runway is right here. So we were only a couple hundred yards from the runway, and these jets would go by you know, every few minutes. Uh, so as a result, if you have any questions, please ask it loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so really, um, what stands out is the size of this site. And you can see we have an arbitrary end right here and an arbitrary end right there. So this site continues in both directions. Uh, but within the project area, Falcon Landing, this footprint is 44 acres in size. So this is an enormous area and we have hundreds of buried features. So that brought us to our next conundrum. What do we do with a huge project area like that? How do we mitigate this? Because we know that already that the features are very shallowly buried and any construction from the solar panel is gonna obliterate anything that's present. So any of these cultural features will be destroyed. So we have to mitigate this entire area. And Beyond that, we have smaller sites. We have a site right here, and we have a portion of this site, and this site right here. Um, so how do you efficiently excavate such an enormous area with so many features? Well, we brought in heavy equipment. And during our excavations, we brought in two 325 series excavators, or track hose. And we needed front end loaders for each of these track hose to move the dirt away from behind them. You can already see right there, there's a big pile of dirt that we can't move until that gets out of the way. Um, so we also had two backhoes going simultaneously with these track hoes that worked at the smaller sites and along the margins of the site. And also to comply with Maricopa County dust laws, we needed four water trucks to continually drive around and keep all the dust down. So this became a, a pretty significant undertaking. Um, so here's that same view standing on a back dirt pile and looking out over the stripping unit. And this isn't really the entire stripped area, this is only a portion of it. Uh, but you can see it's a massive area. And you can see people in the foreground, um, those are the crew members excavating features. And you can see the track hose in the mid ground. And then in the background you can see more back dirt piles. Um, so this was a huge project, it was ballooning into this enormous undertaking. So as a result of our data recovery, we ended up mechanically stripping almost 46 acres. And within those 46 acres, we found over 3,000 features, so almost 10 times what we had during the testing phase. So those 3,000 features uh, consist of over 2,800 extramural pits. Uh, we had 50 prehistoric structures, uh, over 100 burn rock concentrations, uh, we had middens and activity areas and a whole host of other future types. Um, so part of our contract with Luke Air Force Base and our agreement with the SHPO and the tribes 
was to excavate a 50% sample of all the features that we found. So by the end of the project, we were pretty close. We had about 55% that were completely excavated. And by that, I mean they were excavated and uh, recorded uh, to the highest degree, like samples and maps and photographs. So these were fully documented and fully excavated. But another one of our stipulations was to make sure no human remains, no burials or burial items, were left in the project area. So once we reached our 50% sample, we went back and excavated the remainder of the features um, to make sure that there were no human burials left. So at the end of the day, uh, we did actually excavate every single feature that was in the project area. And as a result, we collected uh, over 34,000 artifacts and samples. Uh, which actually sounds like a lot, but uh, in reality, considering the amount of area that we excavated and the number of features, that's actually a pretty meager uh, collection of artifacts. So this is what 3,000 features looks like plotted on map. Um, and this is just a single dot for feature. This isn't their actual shape or size. Um, but already you can see patterns. You know, there's clusters of features in different areas. Um, and you have areas where there aren't any features. Um, so some of our first questions were, what, what do these clusters of features mean? Uh, how are they related? So really to, you know, our next step became uh, placing all these features in time, and figuring out their age. So as I mentioned before, we were building a geochronology using the natural stratigraphy. Well, in the process of building this uh, geochronology, we radiocarbon dated about 100 features. And we chose these features uh, because of, uh, or we chose a large portion of these features based on their stratigraphic position. So if we had a feature at the very bottom of a, of a depositional unit, we could get a radiocarbon date. And then we could get another radiocarbon date from a feature at the top of a certain stratum. And those two dates would bracket the age of that deposition. So we were able to do this repeatedly throughout the whole project area to build this geochronology. And then features that we found, we would uh, associate them with a certain stratum. And then that stratum would have an age based on the geochronology. And then we could assign that age to any feature that existed within that stratum. And in that way, we were able to extrapolate uh, an age for almost every feature. So here's a cumulative uh, pooled probability graph showing all of our radiocarbon dates. Uh, so you can see the red line represents actually radiocarbon dated features. And we had uh, about 100, I think 92 is what it says up there. Um, the green line represents features that were within a given stratum. So we had about 1,100 features that we were able to date in that manner. And then the blue line represents uh, about 160 features in the project area that, was, um, that were located at an unconformity. So they were excavated into the surface of a strata, uh, probably an area that was a stable surface and we had a little bit of soil development. But then the overlying stratum was much younger. And so there was a significant amount of time between uh, that stable surface and when the next strata came over. So those features were very poorly dated. Uh, but we were fortunate enough that we had uh, about 12, 13, 1400 features that were very well dated, or at least well dated enough that we could uh, uh, place them into the chronology of Southern Arizona and really analyze them as, uh, as part of the culture history. And you can see along the bottom here, this represents time. So you can see our radiocarbon dated features begin about 300 or 3300 BC. So that's the beginning of the Middle Archaic period. And you can see uh, definitely there's uh, periods of time when you get intense occupations. And these intense occupations here are represented by uh, clusters of features that we've dated. And then you get periods of time when there's very few features. And then you get another period of time when there's another intense occupational episode. But importantly, this Beginning at 3300 BC, there's almost a continuous occupation all the way up to about 15, 1600 AD. So we have this uh, 
this punctuated yet continuous occupation, which I think is very interesting. Uh, so this shows that people, even though most of the occupation was during the archaic period, people continued to come to this location year after year, generation and generation after generation, uh, which makes this uh, kind of an important place. So here's a simplified graph of the well-dated features that we had, and each of these bars represents a period of time in our chronology. So this is the Middle Archaic period. So about 50% of the well-dated features um, were built and used during the Middle Archaic period. And there's a, a definite drop in the number of features that we had over time, with uh, sort of the early classic period of the Hohokam chronology being sort of the least occupied time. But then a resurgence in sort of the late classic or proto-historic or early historic period. So definitely some trends in occupation that are evident here. So this is what uh, one of our typical features looks like. Uh, this is a roasting pit or a thermal feature. Um, so a lot of the features that we excavated were characterized by the amount of burned rock and charcoal and ash that were present uh, with uh, occasional artifacts. Uh, so we did have uh, thousands of these that we excavated. Um, and we certainly had different sizes and shapes so there's a lot of variability with the pits, but this is sort of a general idea of what they would look like. Uh, we also had several large bell-shaped pits. Um, and just to give you some uh, scale, these two gentlemen here are over six feet tall. So this <coughs> bell-shaped pit is a very large storage pit. And this uh, particular feature was so big that when it was done being excavated, I could crawl inside of it and basically lay down flat in the bottom. I could put my feet up on one side and my head would rest on the other. So it's, this was an enormous feature. And I think this is an indication of some of this uh, storage that they would want to do if they were uh, processing the skeet and needed to come back in a later time. A feature like this would do very well. Uh, this is a very early dated feature in the project area. This is a middle archaic period structure. Uh, radiocarbon dated to about 3000 BC. And you can see this ring of pits along the outside, those are postals. So they would have taken uh, small beams and placed them in those pits uh, to frame the outside of the structure and cover it with grass or brush. Uh, and so these are pretty ephemeral structures. Uh, these are not meant for year-round habitation. These are seasonal structures. Um, and they're, you would think, uh, they're ephemeral. Uh, they're not like the formalized Hohokam houses with plastered floors and ramped entries and plastered hards and stuff like that. Uh, this is another Middle Archaic period structure. Uh, so you can see another uh, sort of ring of post holes. And this one actually has a small bell-shaped pit in the side wall of the structure. So that uh, little indication of uh, storage within a structure or along the outside wall of the structure. Um, these are two late archaic period structures, and they were clipped by this backhoe trench, so we're missing about half of them. Uh, but these two structures appear to share a wall right here. You have two rows of posts that are right up next to each other. And we did get radiocarbon dates from both of these structures, and they came out identical to 840 to 800 calibrated BC. So these are San Pedro aged structures. And I think this is an indication that uh, extended families were coming to this area and they were built, building uh, multiple structures or small groups of structures at once. And we have evidence of this um, in other places where you get two or three or four structures that are all contemporaneous and they're all built very close quarters. Um, so it's likely that people came here uh, with uh, small to medium-sized groups and uh, went about their processing activities. Uh, so here's a uh, late archaic period structure, and this one's unique also because it's uh, rectangular in shape. It also wasn't um, within an excavated pit. So we think of these houses and pits. Well, this one's very different. Uh, we think it was maybe a surface structure and that they would, they placed in these uh, post holes sort of in a rectangular shape to just kind of 
create some shade for uh, whatever activities were going on or some relief from the sun. Uh, these people would have probably been here uh, during the summer months when there was the most amount of rain and also when mesquite pods were ripe. Um, and this is interesting. These are two snake town phase structures or pioneer period Hoakam aged structures. But we didn't know that these were Hoakam aged structures when we excavated them because as you can see, they're practically identical to the middle archaic and late archaic structures. Uh, this one's a little bit larger, but when we were excavating it, there was no indication of it being during the ceramic period. There were no ceramics, uh, no other kinds of material culture that would lead us to believe it wasn't archaic. We didn't know this until we got the radiocarbon dates back. And what else is interesting, the snake time phase, is a period of uh, time when the Hoakam were really starting to flourish in the Phoenix Basin. They were uh, building these elaborate canal systems to irrigate their fields. Um, this is when the red on buff pottery was beginning to be produced along the Gila River and along the Salt River. Um, they started building large villages with big formalized structures, uh, you know, plastered floors and so they started, you know, residing in these villages, but yet people still came to this location, even though, you know, maybe 20 or 30 miles away you had irrigated canals. Um, this was still an important place and people still came here, even though it was less frequently than during the Archaic. Um, this was still a place where people came to build a temporary structure and to gather and process wild plants. So that kind of shows how you know, this continuity of occupation uh, lasted for so many thousands of years. Uh, here's a little synopsis of some of our material culture. Uh, we had 26,000 artifacts, uh, but about 20,000 of those were stone artifacts. Um, ground stone was a very important tool in this project area. Uh, we had you know, over a thousand monos and matates. Uh, we had over 160 pestles, but interestingly, only seven stone mortars. Uh, we think this uh, disparity is perhaps has to do with the inhabitants using wooden mortars, like taking uh, trunks of mesquite trees and using those as the mortar implement uh, for grinding up mesquite. <coughs> Uh, we, also, we also collected uh, over 7,000 pieces of debitage. And the overwhelming majority of this debitage was bifacial debris. So this was the result of people uh, manufacturing bifacial tools like projectile points and knives. Um, but we only had 90 bifacial tools. So again, it seems like the few number of bifaces and projectile points that we had was not enough to really um, it, it wasn't enough to really um, be the result of this much uh, bifacial debris. So we think that, uh, this led us to believe anyway, that there's maybe more than one activity going on at this project in, in this area at once. So clearly the groundstone is, you know, an indication of a heavy investment in plant processing. But at the same time, we have this uh, bifacial tool manufacturing. So what we think is that people came to this location uh, primarily for the processing of plant foods like mesquite, but at the same time they were gearing up for hunting, but they weren't using or leaving these hunting tools in the project area. They were taking them with them. So we think this was uh, an anticipated uh, use of their time where some of the group could be processing mesquite and other people could be making these weapons and they would take those weapons up into the mountains at later times and go hunting there where there's deer. Um, and this is also indicated by the amount of faunal bone. We only had uh, less than 3,000 pieces of faunal bone. Uh, so this represents very few actual individual animals. And this is uh, almost all small fragmentary and burned pieces of rabbit bone. Uh, there was no evidence of any other deer or larger mammals. So we think this is kind of an opportunistic hunting. Like if they were in the mesquite boss and they're collecting mesquite or other wild plants and they see a rabbit, 
you know, maybe they'd go chase it and, you know, have a good dinner. But, you know, I think the amount that we found is, is uh, evidence of its opportunism and that they were not uh, heavily engaged in hunting during this time. Uh, you can also see we had a very meager collection of ceramics, only 126 sherds out of the entire project area. Uh, of those 126, 109 were from the surface of the site. So that's what we collected during phase one before we even started doing backup trenches. Uh, and I think there's maybe one or two uh, decorated vessels, red on buff vessels. Um, so that shows that ceramics were not, uh, not a tool that, were, that was being used uh, with any regularity in the project. Uh, we also analyzed over 300 pollen and macrobotanical samples. Uh, so we have a very strong uh, botanical signature from these samples that shows mesquite, of course, but also kino ams, saltbush, wolfberry, and purslane. So these are some of the wild plants that we find there today. Uh, so it's very interesting how that, how that plays out. Um, like I said, groundstone is very important. Um, we had over 400 complete groundstone tools that we identified just in the mechanical script area. So these are outside of features. Uh, these are just present in the, the natural sediments. So these have been left in place and buried by deposition. So during our analysis, we weighed all of the groundstone tools that we recovered from the project area. And we found that over our almost four tons of groundstone was imported into the site. Like I mentioned before, all of the sediments at this site were very fine grained. It was silt and sand. There was absolutely no rock in these natural sediments. So every rock that we found, we knew had to be imported. And the closest location for stone is the Aguafria River. So that's three miles to the east. So people had to bring all of their tools from the Aguafria River to this location. And we think uh, there is quite a bit of caching on the site. So people would lug these giant stone artifacts or these stone implements. They would use them and then leave them in place in anticipated return. So that they knew season after season and year after year, or even generation after generation, people would come back and they would somehow mark the location of these of these big objects so that they could be used again and again. Um, and actually, actually, let me, uh, I have a special relationship with this mortar and pestle right here. Um, this is a photo of it in situ. So this is how we found it. Um, so the mortar was upright and the pestle was tucked underneath it, just like that. And after we, this was the first uh, pair of groundstone tools that we found in the project. Uh, so after we mapped in its location, uh, we took it back to our storage unit and we kept it on site for the entire project because we thought this was a great opportunity to show the kind of tools that we were finding on the project. So anytime there was a visitor or a site tour or anything like that, uh, I would go and get this from the storage unit and put it out on a little table so that people could go up and look at it and hold it and really get an idea of what it looked like. Well, the pestle, you know, that weighed about seven pounds. So that's not a big deal. But this mortar weighed 80 pounds. And so I began to dread people coming to the site because I knew I had to go and pick up this 80 pound mortar and carry it 10 feet to the table and put it on the table. And, you know, it started to be like backbreaking work. And it got me thinking. I was complaining about having to carry it 10 feet Somebody had to carry it three miles across the desert to this location. And then the more I thought about it, I realized that I call this a mortar because it's been used. 20% of it is gone. So this probably weighed over 100 pounds when somebody had to carry it across the desert to be used here. So that's a tremendous amount of labor. Um, and clearly, you know, that four tons of rock wasn't all brought, you know, on a Wednesday. This was spread out over thousands of years. But still, that's a lot of effort um, to bring all of this stone to the area for, for use. Uh, we also had some interesting uh, pestles here at the bottom. We have these big sort of almond-shaped pestles. And these are, you know, 
like the one up above, these are seven or eight pounds. These are big, heavy implements. Uh, and they're very heavily battered and polished and ground and pecked. Um, and after we had uh, started our analysis, we tried to find similar artifact types in other published literature. We had a very hard time finding examples of these in other projects. Uh, they were only uh, occasionally mentioned at other archaic period sites. Um, and we couldn't find any photos of them. Uh, but we did some more digging, and we found examples of these in some of the ethno-historic literature. Uh, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, some photos of some of our groundstone caches. Uh, you can see this one, two matates are stacked with a little mono. And here's a little basin matate with a couple monos and a couple pestles here. And here's a, the base of another bell-shaped pit, and this one has another mortar in the bottom. So there's all kinds of different uh, caching uh, implements here, different, uh, different varieties of tools and different, uh, different collections. And of course, these caches also cross-cut time. So we have caches that show up during the Middle Archaic period, now, I believe these pestles uh, date to the pre-classic period of the Hohokam. So almost any given time, you have this caching behavior uh, going over and over again in the site. Uh, this is the diagnostic projectile points that we recovered from the site. So it's very few, uh, but they are indicative of uh, the types of features and the ages of the sediments that we're finding. So very heavily uh, weighted towards the archaic period. You get middle archaic points and late archaic points. Uh, there is one uh, snake town phase stem point here. So that's a, a Hohokam age point. But everything else is archaic. Um, I also want to point out our current president of the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society. He couldn't be here today, but uh, I want to thank him for doing such wonderful uh, illustrations of these points that are some of the best I've ever seen. Um, so here's a little synopsis of our project findings. Uh, really what's important is that remarkable stability of the on-site activities and the fact that people occupied this area on and off for 5,000 years. So that's a long history of use. Um, and of course, the collection and processing of native plant foods is very important. Um, and there's several other important uh, aspects of this that sort of cross-cut different cultures or different uh, major cultural changes that happened uh, in the Phoenix area. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is something I alluded to earlier, is the early agriculture that's here in the Tucson Basin. We had virtually no evidence of agriculture or any agricultural <coughs> products in the project area. We had a single grain of maize pollen on the floor of a San Pedro phased structure. And that one aggregate pollen sample uh, is the only, the only sign of any domesticated plants or any agricultural activities. Uh, but like I said, you know, we're only 130 miles away, so the person that left that pollen grain on the floor of that house, you know, may have had contact with uh, early maize, or may have been in contact with another person that was engaged in early agriculture. But even though that they were aware of this important crop and, and possibly even the techniques of early agriculture, they weren't bringing that uh, to the project area, and it wasn't, it wasn't happening in this location. Uh, also, like I mentioned, the, the Hohokam culture, uh, you know, and the uh, elaborate, extensive canal system in the Phoenix Basin. All of this was constructed, and the major population centers with uh, monumental architecture, with ball courts, platform mounds, all of their beautiful pottery, all of this happening. At the same time, people still continue to use this for that mesquite processing. And even though the occupational intensity did decline significantly, uh, it did not stop. So the stability and the predictability of mesquite as a resource is highlighted by this project. And I think it really shows a much larger and elaborate uh, sort of strategy for uh, Sonoran desert cultures, that they um, 
found the importance of this of this location and of this mesquite trees, and they used it as a as part of their livelihoods. As I mentioned before, we have these giant pestles, and we were unable to find very many examples of them in the archaeological literature. But here, this is a photo from 1919 <coughs> showing an Akimel Akdam woman using one of those giant pestles in a wooden mortar. So now we have evidence from the 1900s of somebody using this processing technology that we uncovered as early as 3300 BC. So to me, this is what really fascinates me about anthropology, archaeology, to be able to see this connection, to see a person in a photograph using the processing tools and the techniques that had started thousands and thousands of years ago. So this connection, I think, is, is amazing. And it, it really blows my mind to, to see evidence of this as such a long and continuous and important part of their culture. And uh, in addition, the uh, Akimel Optum name for the mesquite tree is translated as the tree of life. So not only did this tree and the, the importance of that mesquite tree make it in their processing technology, it made it into their language. And that's how important and embedded this is into, the, into their lives and into all the cultures of the Sonoran Desert. Um, so here are some photos of some of the crew that worked out in the field with us. Um, and I want to point out that all the information that I've been talking about today is not my own. This is the result of dozens and dozens of hardworking people in the field and in the lab and in the office, um, analyzing artifacts and coming to these conclusions. And I'm uh, really, I'm uniquely privileged to be a part of such a, a dynamic and strong team that were able to do so much work uh, and come up with these fascinating results. Um, and actually, some of them I see in the audience today, and even though I would like to point them out and embarrass them individually, I will not. <laughs> but they are here, and I want to uh, you know, acknowledge that their hard work uh, has definitely come to some, some great fruition. Uh, finally, I want to thank you for coming out tonight and listening to me. Uh, I hope what I have said is at all interesting, or is at least as interesting as it is to me. Um, but thank you very much. John? Yes. Um, what you surmise happened in the landscape between the three miles and your balcony site? In other words, all was happening. Do you think that same sort of thing occurred all the way down to Agua Fria? Well, that's a good question. Well, because certainly the Agua Fria would have been another area where there would have been water and trees. So <clears throat> it's certainly interesting because that, and that occurred to me, why if they had the Agua Fria River, which would undoubtedly have had you know, a lush, barbarian environment, why did they come three miles across the desert to this location? Uh, maybe it was more secluded, or maybe the mesquite trees were more productive, or something. I don't know. It's a good question. Yes. Two things. Uh, you didn't mention it, but were the roasting pits for agave? Uh, we did not find any evidence of agave. Oh. Yeah. And secondly, isn't it fairly well understood through the work of Richard Felger and others that those types of pestles are historically used to crack really hard mesquite seeds. I'm not talking about the soft, fluffy, high-carbo right. mesocarp, but right. to actually crack, to the, crack seeds. the seeds. To crack the seeds, yeah. Well, we think that that was uh, part of their process, and that there was a, <clears throat> perhaps even in times of stress, they would go after the seeds um, in addition to the pods. Because like you said, the pods are, are pretty easy to get to. Um, so we think that there is maybe a, a sort of, um, how would I say that, um, sort of a spectrum of processing tools. Because we had flat 
matates, and basin matates. Uh, we didn't have any trough matates, but certainly we had a whole variety of processing tools, grinding and pounding implements. So we think they may have been going after um, not only the mesquite pods and the seeds, but also smaller seeds like kino hams. And, so I think there was a lot of a lot of different processing going on. Yes. Do you have any sense of how many people would have been involved? Well, we think they were probably small groups. Um, you know, we, uh, based on some of the clusters of structures that we had, it was usually two or three structures was the maximum. Uh, so you think maybe, you know, one small nuclear family per structure, or you had an extended family distributed throughout the several. So it probably wasn't a big group. Uh, but when you're talking about radiocarbon years, of course, you're looking at hundreds of years. Um, so it's, uh, the way I think of it, at least, it's more of an intense uh, period of time. And people, you know, during several hundred years were coming to this probably every season. And then in periods of time, uh, you get uh, fewer and fewer people, and then you get less occupation. So it's probably, uh, the number of people was probably very low uh, at any one time. But of course, it's hard to know for sure. Yes. Did you find any burials? Um, yes, actually, we did find two human burials, um, and they were both um, I would characterize as secondary cremations. They were both burned, and they were very scattered, so they were uh, in very poor condition as far as their preservation. Um, but I think as a result, um, it to me means that people were not burying their dead there. I think maybe those two burials that we identified were, um, could have been, um, you know, strange circumstances. But I, I think if, um, while people occupied this area, if somebody that they were with died, I bet that they probably would have taken them with them and buried them at a, more of a, a base camp that they were actually living. Because I think this was more of a temporary kind of location just for the processing. So. Yes, sir. If you ever go to the Arizona State Museum uh, photo archive, you may find a photograph from around 1978 or so, uh, where I photographed uh, a Tohono down lady, uh, Juanita a hill, okay. and she we walked up a hill, and up there were uh, rock mowers, okay. and she carried her pestle up there, uh -huh. and that was for a demonstration. Oh, okay. It's not that she does a daily, right. uh, but uh, Bill Dolly was with me, and he weighed every ounce of mesquite. That oh, she yeah. had ground into a meal, right. and she separated the beets, out of the, the seeds out, and okay. discarded those. But the meal she then made out of it, a cake out of mm -hmm. it, which they took on travel with them. And right. the cake was actually just the meal sprinkled with water, okay. and that dried, and she made another layer, and that dried, and that. She said traditional, they took this on their long foot travel. Oh, okay, so it was a traveling through. Tradition. So I could say that tradition was far back. Yeah. But they, it was still done in 1970s. Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing. And we actually were able to find several publications that showed uh, people using those pestles. Um, and actually, I might know the one that you're talking about, because it does sound familiar. Using them in stone or in uh, bedrock mortars like that. Yeah. Yes. So I've got two questions. So one is the pestles. It looked to me like they could be used as accents. Well, you know, they weren't. Um, they were pretty blunt, and the ends of those big pestles were very polished. Um, we think that's the result of being used in the wooden mortars, but. Um, you know, it's possible that they could have used them as axes. It would have, wouldn't have been the most efficient, but uh, they're definitely heavy and 
they would have, you know, caused a lot of damage for sure. If they yeah, the other question is. Uh, I'm sure that that site <laughs> continues to the north and to the south. Yeah, because you can see in that one of the maps of the site, you know, we were constrained by the project area, but we could tell uh, that the that landform where we were finding the features continued uh, at least several hundred meters to the south. Uh, and actually, the uh, the Mesquite Bosque was only about three or four hundred meters to the south. Uh, and I forgot to mention this when I was uh, showing you the picture of it, but it has since been destroyed. It's no longer there. Uh, there's only a small little piece of area left where those trees still exist. Um, so most of it's been chewed up by housing developments. Do you know if there was any excavation or maybe surface examination uh, before the base was installed? Yeah, I don't know of any. I don't think they. I don't think they investigated it. I think the base was built in the late 40s, I think, early 50s, and they didn't uh, they didn't do any archaeology ahead of that. So. John. Yeah. So uh, partially following up on that, you know, one of the things about the archaeology of the Luke Air Force Base in general is that it's very ephemeral. Right. Right. So, and, and let, you know, anybody who's say building the runway unless they find ground stone. Right. It's, you know, it takes a really trained eye to be able to identify. Them. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's not the Hoacom. Right. You know, it does. Not big grandiose. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but, but I just want to follow up on you know some of your statistics. You've had three thousand features and fifty houses. Do you think that those 50 houses were just very good examples of well-preserved architecture, and that there were probably a lot more houses associated with some of those clusters? Of yeah, I think that's probably the case. Yeah, yeah, we did uh, one of the feature types that we had, uh, we were calling it an activity area. And it was basically this big area of cultural fill. So we could tell it was there was something there, but it was too big to be a pit. And we'd excavate these areas, and we wouldn't find any walls or post holes or entryways or hearths or anything like that. But we would find, I mean, it would have, you know, it was a depressed area and it did, you know, infill with cultural material and there were pits. Um, and we called those activity areas because we really had no other thing to call them. And we didn't have any evidence other than their sort of size and shape that they were structures. I think we had maybe 15 or 20 of those that I think are probably structures. But uh, like I said, you know, the, uh, the uh, position of these features only a few uh, 50 or so centimeters below the ground. They were all exposed to uh, rainwater percolating, uh, rodents, and insects, and tree roots. So there was a lot of disturbances. And uh, it was very difficult to uh, decipher some of these features. Okay. What do you think the, how late do you think the latest use was? Um, well, again, we're talking about radiocarbon years, and that point in the radiocarbon curve is pretty broad, so I think we had several dates that were from 14 to 1600 AD, so we, uh, I believe I was taking the midpoint of that and just saying around AD 1500. Um, but they weren't uh, very precisely dated, so we didn't have, you know, you know, down to the year or anything like that. So. And what were you using for the dates? What kind of material? Uh, we would use um, plant material. Um, we had the fortune of having lots of burned annuals, like saltbush and kinoam seeds and horse purslane that have a very short life. Uh, so we dated those as often as possible, um, and those gave us a little bit more precise age ranges. Uh, in other cases, we defaulted to mesquite, uh, which of course you know brings in the whole old wood problem, and the fact that it could have been there for a long time before it was burned, or that it lives forever you know before it falls over. So um, yeah, we definitely uh, tried to get annual remains as, as most. 
Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the salt domes. Yes. Could they have attracted people and been used as trade goods? Well, the salt, salt itself was, um, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's three or 400 feet below the ground. So okay. these are very deep deposits. Okay. Yeah, so, and I felt that too, because we, at one point, um, anytime it rained, you would get salt accumulating on the outside, or the insides of pits that we excavated. Um, so I thought, you know, maybe these sediments are so alkaline that salt crystals actually grow anytime it gets wet. And then I was disappointed later to find out that the water trucks that were working in the project area were getting their water from a well. And this well was pulling up, well, <laughs> pulling up water from very deep where these salt deposits were. So they were basically spraying salt water over the whole project. There we go. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, they are actually still in our laboratory um, at Statistical Research. And we are waiting for the report to be finalized. And once we get uh, that final report, and once that we know there are no longer any agency comments or client comments, uh, we will curate the entire collection at the uh, Gila Bend Air Force Auxiliary Field, which is uh, if you're familiar with the Barry and Goldwater Range, uh, just south of Gila Bend, they have an auxiliary field. And they have a warehouse there where they keep collections from the Goldwater Range. But ours is going to be the first collection that's not from the Goldwater Range. But because it is part of Luke Air Force Base, that's where, that's where all the material is going to go. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, I, I came from Oregon, and I have in my yard, I have a, a solar ski where I live. Yeah. Uh, 17 miles of water come down the to some wash through my yard. Oh, yeah. And I, I, when I saw your article about your uh, discussion, I, I never thought about how, in what past time period, they would have been grinding my mosquito trees. That's right. Sorry. It's mind blowing. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> Because I'm not very far from the Oracle State Park. Oh, okay. So the, the wash is a little bit less sure. from this. And what kind of um, source of history of that kind of thing is available? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> it's not directly related to your project, but it's Yeah, like well, groundstone is uh, a tricky type of artifact. It's hard to really place it in time. And actually this project made me realize that more than anything, because before I thought, oh, you can kind of tell when a mono matate was used, but no longer, you know, because now you get pestles that were used, you know, 3300 BC are identical to the ones used in 1920 or 1970. So, you know, it's really, I think, a poor indicator. Um, principally because people were using these techniques these uh, processes uh, over and over again. Once they found something that was successful, they would adopt it and use it over and over again. So, yeah, it's not like finding pottery or projectile points where you can, you know, figure out how old it is by looking at published reports. It's much more, much well, more tricky. The, this is part of the huge rock structures that are already there. It's not a separate thing. Okay. So, I, I just my my question is. Up until how recently were people using these heat trees to Yeah, well, I think certainly uh, there's evidence of uh, you know, people living along the Santa Cruz River and up into the, you know, up into the Bajada uh, when the Spanish arrived here. It was, uh, I think, relatively heavily pop populated along the river. So people could have been here, or people were here in the 1500s, and they stayed around during the Spanish. And, uh, and they're still here today, so. Do you have any observations or thoughts on how these folks supply themselves with water? Uh, you know, that's a conundrum. Um, I wonder if maybe the Mesquite Bosque that was south of the site would have had uh, surface water during monsoon season. Especially, you know, when stuff is rushing down the drainages, 
it hits this low spot and high water table. Um, we did have a single feature in the project area that um, may have been a reservoir. It was very small, only you know maybe you know the size of a really big bathtub, uh, and a little bit deeper. But it was right in the path of this drainage, so we think maybe you know if there were years that it was dry, they may have been able to dig you know just a few feet uh, below the surface and kind of tap that groundwater, or at least trap it if it's. You know, if it only flows once in a blue moon, you know, at least you can capture some of it to use. I think that's the only the only way they could do it, other than hauling it from the Agua Fria River. But that was the only site, the only location you saw any indication of like nitro containment for seasonal water. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank John again. All right.